indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we'll fight for it. Well, someone look at this as Invasion America, death throes of a superpower. In reality, it is America awakening. We will face the threat head on and we shall be victorious. It is the later part of February, 1994. The enemy's plans, and when I say enemy, I mean internationalist plans, are far in excess of what they'd probably anticipated 10 years ago. They're behind schedule, but they're still very much along and into their original scheme. I want you to think back a little bit. Imagine it's midday. You hear your dog barking outside. You all know what your dog sounds like. Well, you know the dog's got something outside that doesn't seem quite right, so you grab your rifle, and you and your friend run outside, and follow the dogs out into the side of the house, and then around the corner in the backyard, and then in the backfield. About 100 yards away, somebody jumps out and shoots your dog. Well, you all know that that's a death threat. The individual immediately turns and prepares to fire on you. You realize even as that happens that other, other individuals pop up out of the shrubbery and the greenery and they prepare to fire on you also. So you fire back. Realizing that you're outnumbered, you turn to run and as you do, you're hitting the arm. And then as you begin to run farther, you're hit square in the middle of the back and you fall face forward realizing it's your last breath. Is this Germany? 1940? Is this Russia? 1939 or 1955? No. This is the United States of America this last year in Idaho. Your family recovers your body and puts it in a garage because, or a small shed because you're so remote that it takes hours to get to the nearest outpost. And while your family is checking on your body and your father reaches up, he feels a tug at his arm. He's been shot. As he returns to the house, your mother, his wife, holding the door for you with a 10-month-old baby in her arms, is hit with a 308 round which crashes through her face and then passes through one of your best friends. Both of them fall to the ground, one mortally wounded, the other one seriously injured. Your father now bleeding quite heavily. He goes back to the porch and drags your mother back inside and puts her under the kitchen table. Nazi Germany, 1939. Soviet Russia, 1935. No. The United States of America, the 90s. You're in church with a group much like this right here. And you're talking. And you hear the cattle cars roll up. And out of the back doors charge a bunch of black clad, ski masked, coal scuttle helmeted individuals with assault weapons, real assault weapons. And they try to take your church and your home on your own property, on private fight. The enemy is repulsed, but you are laid to siege. Is this the Warsaw Ghetto? No. Is this somewhere in the Ukraine during the Harvest of Sorrows? No. It's the United States of America in the 90s. Eventually, you and your comrades, after being laid to siege and having psychological warfare, conventional arms drawn against you, tanks, aircraft, are eventually overwhelmed by a mechanized force, and you are burned alive. Or, while burning alive, perhaps you take your own life because you felt that one, that pain was a little too much for you and you decided to make it a little easier for yourself, or your children, perhaps. Why didn't you surrender? Because you had the convictions of your beliefs. Nazi Germany? No. Russia? No. Communist China? Well, yes, there too. We're talking the United States in the 1990s. If you do not understand that your freedom is in peril, you need only for a change put yourself in the shoes of your fellow citizens. To quote an adage from our founding fathers, gentlemen, if we do not hang together, we shall surely hang separately. And 100 Wacos, 
and 100 Ruby Creeks are to follow. And a march of black, blue, black booted, black uniformed terrorists called federal forces or international police shall march across this nation and take it from you. Is this Orwell in 1984, which of course he wrote many years earlier? Is this a storybook? Is this fiction? This is reality that you've all seen on American television today. And many of you got a chance to see it for 51 days. It became an entertaining experience for many people who are very uneducated. It was not entertainment to me. And I'm sure that to you listening in the audience, it was not entertainment either. It is the reality of a government gone awry. Actually, I would call it a regime. It is not our government. Our limited constitutional republic has been usurped by a series of individuals who, if they have their way, will progress with the similar actions that we've just described time and again. For if they can get away with it once, they will do it again and again and again and again. What kind of people are we dealing with that would do this? What kind of people are they overall? Well, let's look at some of their mottos. The MJTF police, their motto, they are the velvet glove on the iron fist. Well, I don't care who the heck you are, velvet glove or not, the iron fist hurts. Pretty or not, it can kill. Our enemy has a vast array of arms at his disposal, or its disposal, depending upon how you look at it. They have been planning for years, decades, half centuries, and centuries. It is not an accident, it is by plan. And because of this, with all of the convolutions that are involved with our aggressor and the way that he functions, he understands full well that his time is limited now. For the American people as a whole are beginning to turn their heads in one direction. Not backbiting amongst themselves, not fighting amongst themselves, but realizing that we have a common threat. And that common threat stands before us now. If we are to maintain freedom in this nation, if we are to protect our families, if we are, if we are to ensure that the seed which we have planted, which we call our children, are to come to fruition, then we as a generation and as a people must make a stand now or die in slavery and chains. There should be no doubt in anybody's mind where we are headed. The enemy had hoped for this though, and when I say enemy again I will repeat the internationalists for those people who like to nitpick. The enemy, abbreviated, expected riot, but will get reason expected reaction, but is now going to get response. Instead of riot and chaos, we shall have battle-hardened troops, and we shall destroy the enemy that stands before us. Not stones, but bullets. Aircraft, tanks, whatever it takes, and however long it takes, we are going to have to stand and fight against this aggressor. Now, does that mean that I'm looking for a place to die or that I'm looking to try and find a place for you to die? I am not a pessimist, I am an optimist. It saddens me that we are going to have to do and that we have to discuss the issues that are here, but I would rather do it now than from a pit before they put a bullet to the back of my head. And I guarantee that if we lose, that we in this room and many other people like us all over the nation aren't going to be around much beyond their victory. This is a winner-take-all game. One side wins, they take all. We win, we don't want anything that they have. There is nothing that they possess that I cherish. But there is one thing that I do cherish, and that is my freedom. We draw the line now. There will be no more Wacos, and there will be no more Ruby Creeks. Many Americans across the country have already agreed to this. Now a lot of people would challenge, well, what do we do, fight tanks? I didn't tell you to go out and fight tanks. Tank shows up, I wouldn't fight it. But if there is no crew, tank does not go down the road. 
And if a pilot doesn't make it to the plane, the plane doesn't get off the ground. We will have to fight on our terms with what resources we have. Will it be a home by Christmas war? Well, I'll tell you what, everybody's talked about that in the past. I will not even try to create that illusion for you. It is going to be a long and arduous task. Many of us may not live to see the end of it, but we are going to have to face it. I am willing to pay that price. That's why I stand before you today, knowing full well that there are many people who would like my head right now, I'm sure. But with that in mind, I have no choice but to forge ahead and continue with the task that's at hand. Now, some people, and I've heard this from out west from different, with different arguments, and we have many good patriots out west. We have many to the north, the south, and the east. There are millions. We're in communications with many of them on a daily basis. It is awe-inspiring to see. But we've heard, for instance, from out west, well, this won't affect me. They're not going to come to my door and take my gun. They're going to bother with all the other people. Everybody in their illusion believes it's going to be the other guy. Or in other words, the committee program. Everybody points to the right or the left, and it's a big circle. It's the other guy they're going to get. We're going to make a deal. A deal only exists when there are two sides. And again, I will remind you, there is but one if there is victory assured for them. And then there's no deal. Power corrupts. Absolute power absolutely corrupts. Well, taking it from the overview, to remind you where we all stand with the threat that faces us, at the lowest level we have the MJTF police. Now, we've heard many arguments in the past uh, year and a half about, well, the MJTF police doesn't exist, etc. It's now popping up publicly virtually at every corner of the nation. Publicly announced in Maryland, publicly announced in Louisiana, publicly announced in Washington State, Chicago, Florida, it is rearing its head everywhere. The multi-jurisdictional task force, its mission is to encompass and collect all local law enforcement to bring it under the iron fist. Remember that local law enforcement is the last defense that you have against tyranny, along with your county sheriff. Your county sheriff is to protect you and protect your constitutional rights. He is sworn to do so. He is governed by you as a voter. If the MJTF police, if FinCEN, if the Directorate of Central Law Enforcement become, become power, you will have absolutely no say in the future of your county, your township, your city, your village, your burg, your home. Now beyond the MJTF police, we have FinCEN, F-I-N-C-E-N. FinCEN are foreign military and secret police and collection agencies brought in under a single umbrella. Not admitted to two years ago, we now have sufficient data to demonstrate the budget for the agency and the fact that they are interlocked with Interpol, the United Nations, and several other agencies that are international. They are virtually becoming the black shirts of this nation. Now a new one under sub-Emperor Gore is the Directorate of Central Law Enforcement. The Directorate of Central Law Enforcement will now encompass all major agencies and bring them together to create one fist. The Directorate of Central Law Enforcement encompasses FBI, DEA, ATF, Federal Marshals, Customs, the Treasury with all respects. Bringing them all into one umbrella, they will be a virtual national secret police force a power the likes of which our founding fathers warned us time and time and time and time again. Washington, despite the fabrications that have been created or the rewriting of history, probably one of the, the greatest men that we've ever seen in this nation and ever will, an individual who was truly a sovereign of this nation, stated uncategorically that you trust no single group of men nor a single person with that type of power because power will corrupt. I wish they were here today. I wish we had them for two days. They probably, as we discussed last night, would probably be hard holding them back from going to Washington and shooting these people or raising an army. If he had 48 hours, I can imagine what he would say. But many of the other founding fathers would have the same place here now where they, could, they would see the corruption immediately. 
Now, the Directorate of Central Law Enforcement isn't the last here, and I'm sure that there are many others we haven't even heard of yet. And I think it should be remembered that there are many tiers to this. But these are the key or the linchpins that they will use to cut wedges into the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and they already have. In addition to that, United Nations Combat Forces. Even now, as we speak this day, we are hearing more and more about Bosnia-Herzegovina, Croatia, Serbia, Somalia, Kampuchea, which is now Cambodia again. I love how the, map, you know, the maps flip-flop back and forth. And as we find out more, we find out how much more you as American taxpayers are paying on a daily basis, more and more and more. Bosnia's mission is to bleed white the American military machine and disperse it throughout the planet. Bosnia, Macedonia, Africa, by spreading American forces under UN cloak, under the beret, the blue helmet, or the blue hat, our commands will be separated. And while we certainly have over a million men in uniform, we will be the minority force with virtually every United Nations activity that takes place. What that means is this. If you are an individual military, military commander and you are patriotic, how do you get your troops back? If there's 11,000 of you here, 18,000 of you there, contrary to what they see show in Hollywood, you don't have indigenous tanks, you don't have indigenous aircraft, you don't have indigenous ships. The best you might be able to do is bring back some of your troops by hijacking planes or commandeering military aircraft. But what you literally have is the active military force of the United, Stra the United States spread across the globe and weakened beyond belief. It's been accepted already that we cannot militarily support a number of formations in the field. In other words, two. We're talking about five, 10, 15, perhaps 17 locations in which we have committed active military forces and we cannot properly support them if we go to war. What you might see is a number of corrigidors. Gradually over a period of weeks, the radio is going silent because the forces no longer have the capability to fight or are overrun by foreign military aggression. One at a time, your daughters, your sons, your uncles, your aunts, your fathers, your mothers, dying overseas in stupid, senseless little actions for the sake of the international police. Accident, nothing in politics is accidental. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That person was a professional politician, as you all know. And he knew exactly what to say about politicians. And he knew exactly how politics runs. So I think we can take at least some, some semblance of belief from that as, as far as the, the reality of, of politics in the United States and globally. Now the globalists, who are they? Who is it that's pulling the strings here in the United States right now? And of course, they've always been here. Make no mistake about it. This threat is not something of this century. This threat has been with us for as long as this nation has existed. It is not new to you. It is not new to me. It is not new to our grandparents, our great-grandparents, or the Founding Fathers. From the moment that this nation was brought to power, a formidable force was paralleling it called the Illuminati. Now there are arguments, plus or minus, about who created who. But the fact of the matter is this, that as soon as it was perceived by the monarchists, the Imperium, that their monopoly was threatened. They had to conceive of a plan to bring the Americas and many other people who were getting these strange ideas about freedom in the back of their heads back into the mainstream of peasantry. With peasantry, you do nothing but follow. And you certainly don't have to worry about much as a slave unless you become an, uh, shall we say, a, an undesirable slave or perhaps uh, not economically maintainable, as in our health care plan that's coming up, I mean National Death Sentence Program, because that's what that is. Well, the monarchists back then with the Illuminati decided they had to have a counterforce. Its mission was to get back into the United States, or what we were calling the United States at the time, or these United States. In addition to that, we had several other organizations that were progressively organized over a period of years, but one of them right now has many, many members in this existing regime, and that's the Rhodes system, Rhodes Scholars. When Rhodes created this, one of his missions was to offer back to England 
those assets which it had lost over a number of years and to bring the United States back under the British glove, the Iron Fist. Have they done so? Well, let me give you a point here. Uh, earlier this last month, a certain individual who was a president of the United States, George Herbert Walker Bush, went to England to see his queen. He has now knelt down and been knighted by Queen Elizabeth, receiving due honors for his actions here in the United States. What does that tell you about your enemy? Comes full circle. Now some people would say, and in fact I've heard this many times before, that socialism is our enemy. Socialism is the problem. Well, socialism is the problem. Communism is a problem. Fascism is a problem. However, they are but illusions of the final solution that your enemy is, is going to implement here in the United States. Because socialism is not the final step. Socialism, if you look at a, a, a track of time, is but a way to consolidate force and power and energy so that single personalities might come together and take it over. If socialism is the final goal, I'd have to ask you all this. Why is it that in virtually every European nation, all of the traditional monarchical families of pre-1914 are now identified? Even on lifestyles of the rich and famous, we had a little blurb showing the original family line of France, and they haven't had a king for how long? The original family line of Russia, which has been identified, and in fact what was Yugoslavia, now all of the many little states, are back to where they were in pre-1914 configuration. And if you will all remember, where did World War I start? Ah, thank you, Croatia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia. And from there, the war blossomed out and became a global envelopment that spanned from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from pole to pole, and changed the virtual face of the maps of every nation, creating the convolutions and the terrors that became the next two wars after that, including World War II, of course, which was most important. Why, if we we're going to socialism, would you need to identify monarchical family lines? because socialism won't be around for very long. To the monarchists, we are an aberration. We're a pimple, we're a bump, we're a strange track that they're going to push back in line. We're a spur that should not have existed. Or as one friend of ours said, what we are is a failed experiment. Well, we aren't failed, we just realized our full potential and we're going to go farther still. Eventually, we will build this nation up to greatness and it will be done with the people. It will be done with the olive branch. It will not be done with the sword. It will not have to be done with oppression. It will not have to be done with terror. Example, have you noticed our enemy with the health care plan, which is just for your own good? Oh, yes. It's just for your own good, but of course, if you destroy your national ID, I mean, whoops, not national ID card, it's your health care card. But if you destroy your national ID card, two years in prison. If you do not have the card, two years in prison. We're only here to help you. Well, gee. Again, if it is good, it will survive the light of day. It can come out in the open. If it is dangerous or evil, it fears the scrutiny of free men and women. And that's what happened with this health care package, for instance. It was all done behind closed doors. You didn't really need to know what was going on. Well, I challenge again, if it is good, it shall survive the light of day and any scrutiny by all of us. So then you gotta ask, well, what are they gonna do to us, not for us? Well, with a national ID card, I mean, oops, national health care card, which of course our emperor, Emperor Blythe, showed everybody, remember? Did it right there in the House and the Senate. Gotta see it. Got to have it. Remember that. Well, when he showed it to everybody, what he did is he demonstrated to you his power, at least his assumed power, because you gave it to him. You've handed it over. You let him get as far as he's gone. And there's a basic rule to warfare when you are dealing with war, and that's what this is, economical, both economic, military, social, etc., is that if you are the enemy, 
the other side will take everything you're stupid enough to give for free. So that when it comes time to actually fight, you fight for key and crucial resources. And you do not expend your resources against frivolous or extraneous activities. And that's what they're doing now. They're taking everything they can for free. Does this affect us down to the community level? Well, an interesting tidbit that was passed to me by John, which I'd like to bring up, they're priming the pump here in Hillsdale. And I will pass this on. This is the Hillsdale Daily News, Tuesday, February 22nd, 1994. There's an excellent little political cartoon here. But I'll read you some of the titles. Teacher tired of students rationalizing drug use. Drug issue not one for fence sitting. We must go on the offensive. Are they saying, mom and dad, deal with this problem? No. After all, if you're going to get big government into everybody's home, you've got to convince the home that it can't take care of itself. And so what they have to do is lay the groundwork. The media is one of their tools. Upon laying the groundwork, demonstrating the problem, as we say, it's called thesis, antithesis, synthesis, create the drug problem, demonstrate the drug problem, and then come up with a solution that otherwise you as free American citizens and sovereigns would not accept. And so that is exactly what they have done. Does it tri trickle down, remember that term, trickle down to the lowest level? Well, absolutely, because here it is. Is it a national problem? Yes. Is it a state problem? Yes. Is it a family problem? More so than anything else. If you do not deal with it personally, if people do not take responsibility, and I don't mean from the government end because the government told you, but because you have a moral obligation to take care of your own front porch, if we dealt with it at the lowest end, there's no way they could conceivably have the excuse at the higher end. Now that doesn't mean there's a vast array of tools that they've pointed at you. Example, this is in the Christian Science Monitor, Tuesday, February 15th, 1994. Cries against crime lead to proposal for regional prisons. Lord Vader's regional prisons. Regional? Well, I thought we had states. Well, that gets into this whole other rigmarole that we have called regional government. Will that affect you locally? Absolutely. Because incorporating this with law enforcement at this end, remember, local law enforcement ceases to exist it becomes the MJTF police. Eventually, they will be brushed aside and, oh, I guarantee a very aloof and unaffected law enforcement agency will be involved. It will also be a very dangerous law enforcement agency because it will not be able to answer to the local citizenry. It will be isolated because it will be regional. How many of you have dealt with the state already? How much fun is it to try and communicate to the state and they're just in Lansing? The reason they need to go to regional government is because with regional government, you become even more isolated as a citizen with absolutely no say in government. By the way, did you elect your regional officials? No, because none of them are elected. They are directly assigned. They are directorate ships. So again, they have circumvented the Constitution and the, and the Bill of Rights intentionally. There is no accident here. Long-term, essential planning to hit key points for free before you go and envelop a specific objective. Now, regional prisons, that's just one of many activities that they're involved in. With the MJTF, that'll be regionally coordinated. By the way, your food will be regionally coordinated, and it is partially already. For all of you who are farmers, you would understand this right away. What else is regionally governed? Virtually every aspect of government at the federal level at this time. They have state liaisons, but they are almost ready to brush aside the states. Does this violate the Constitution? Absolutely. For I want you all, if you do, have it with you to pull out your liberty teeth. What I have here is a pocket constitution and bill of rights. Yeah, very good. At least one man here has it standing here. I understand we'll get more. But the point is this. 
In here it explains that no new states can be made by dividing a state, nor by bringing several states or two states together. Well, I didn't know that was in the Constitution. Yes, it is in the Constitution, because the Founding Fathers understood collusion and conspiracy. And to ensure that no consolidated separate confederation would get together and usurp our Bill of Rights, they intentionally set up checks and balances, and this was one of the many checks and balances that existed to protect us. A series of states could come together, become a conglomerate, and virtually rule the rest of the nation. The other problem they understood is that with isolated large government, there would be no input from the people, which is exactly what we're seeing now. Now, a lot of people would say, and I've heard this before and I've heard this again time and time over, well, they couldn't get away with that. I've even heard in government buildings most recently with the announcements of confiscations of firearms in Louisiana, they can't do that. They wouldn't let that happen. Well, who's they? Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. You are the they. You know, we have met the enemy and he is us. Remember that? Well, we got a little document here, which we have also outside, and I recommend that everybody get a copy today. Please do, and make plenty of copies. This is the internal agenda, agenda for Handgun Control Incorporated. Now, I will remind you that when the Brady Bill was passed, it was what? The first step. If that's the first step, that implies, and when they say first, that means that you are on a path. What's going to happen when the next foot hits? And remember, that's only two steps. Well, if you want to find out, it's right here. But what I thought was most fascinating is one comment, and I will try to find it quickly so that I'm not wasting time here. What was only a dream 10 years ago can be a reality as early as this year. This entire agenda, they are anticipating the possibility of accomplishing before the end of this year. What does it include? Well, with regard to gatherings, I thought this was most fascinating because these are some of the most important. Because this again affects this document right here. Over a number of years, but specifically within this year, banning gun shows. Well, we all know how many of us are getting our firearms and the fact that that exists. Banning of military reenactments. Are any of you voyageurs who like to go to rendezvous? Mon Dieu. Well, I'm sorry, that is a paramilitary activity. Even if it's black powder, you are guilty of sin, you're out of here. It's a felony. Civil War reenactments, you're out of here. It's a felony. World War I reenactments, paramilitary operation, you're out of here. World War II reenactments, or any paramilitary training, all illegal. Now, some states have already implemented similar activities to this. This one I like. Article 31, banning unlawful the assembly of more than four armed individuals who are not peace officers or military. Since most hunting parties consist of four, we recognize the need to eliminate the currently legal assembly of shooters for paramilitary training or private lands. This is just one good suggestion for our elimination of, quote, gun culture from the American mainstream. You like bunny hunting and you all thought you weren't going to get touched because after all, it was all those other people who had guns and you were going to make a deal. Remember, gentlemen, if you do not hang together, you shall surely hang separately. Make no mistake about it. Begin, the cur begin to curb uh, hunting on all public lands. Blood sports are an anathema to the civilized society. However, it has been a political, political reality that the hunters and their ilk have too strong a stranglehold on Congress. We feel that the impending defeat of high-tech assault killing machines will open the door, camel's nose in the tent, to restrictions. With the diminishing number of hunters, we feel that perhaps in five years we can open up much more of our country to campers and hikers and eliminate the threat to families out camping by lo locking up more restrictions as to what parcels of land will allow hunting. This will not infringe on sportsmen's right to hunt on private land initially. Get a copy of it. Now, how will it affect you? 
These are your other liberty teeth. The only reason that this has any power whatsoever is because one of the checks and balances to ensure that nobody, but nobody would acquire enough strength was to have the firearms to ensure that it was backed up. They are interlocked. Just as assuredly as a link of chain. Break one, they fall. Does our enemy understand this? Oh, yes, he does. Does our enemy have patience? Oh, absolutely. If you are stupid enough to believe that disarming the American people is going to create liberty, you need only go back to the fact that who will possess all the arms? A central, single government. Power corrupts, absolute power absolutely corrupts. Where can they go from here? Well, I'd have to ask the same question again. What in the United Nations Charter can be offered to you as an American citizen if you have the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? Nothing. Zero. In fact, the point being, they will have to take away from your Bill of Rights and Constitution in order for the United Nations Charter to be implemented. Rights and Constitution in order for the United Nations Charter to be implemented. Example, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Mr. Farrakhan in uh, Florida had a lieutenant who made several derogatory comments. Interesting. Now, he has the right to say whatever he wishes to say. Make no mistake about it. Obviously, he hit the wrong cavity and the wrong nerve. Yesterday and the day before yesterday, the Senate was to vote on a bill that would restrict our freedom of speech and our First Amendment rights. Before yesterday, the Senate was to vote on a bill that would restrict our freedom of speech and our First Amendment rights. Was this an accident? No. Create the problem, demonstrate the problem, and also come up with a solution that would not be acceptable otherwise. That's the mission. With regard to the activities, remember, as was commented by an individual on C-SPAN two days ago, and it's amazing this even got out, but it was live so they couldn't stop him, he said nothing like this has ever been passed in the United States. Well, that's true, but obviously he's not up to speed because there are a lot of other things that have been happening the last year and a half that have never happened in the United States either. Because of isolation in institutions like this, and because they are intentionally isolated, many components of the population have no inkling of an idea what reality is. The objective behind institutions are to channel and close the line of thought so that there will be no conflict with regard to other dogmas that might come in and open up or change or alter that particular cadre that you're creating. That's the mission of education facilities. It doesn't make a difference whose it is, right, wrong, left, indifferent. They still serve the same purpose. Now an example is this. Review of the United Nations Charter, Collection of Documents, Subcommittee on the United Nations Charter, pursuant to S. Resolution 126, 83rd Congress, first session. This is a restricted document in virtually every university in the United States. 86 copies were originally made. Only two exist in private hands. This is one of the two. Both the Secret Service and the FBI tried to collect this document. Why? This is the document drawn up to abolish the United States of America. It is accessible here. If you request, specific photocopies can be made. And trust me, the only reason we still have this in our hand is because we've made thousands of copies. But otherwise, had they had their way, this would have gone into the furnace or the black hole, as Orwell said. Most colleges and universities are controlled by the Institute for Social Research, or at least all of their libraries are. The University of Michigan's libraries were taken over initially by the Institute for Social Research back in 1978 through 79. Progressively over a period of years, they have now accumulated virtually every library on campus. Oh, they don't restrict books on campus, do they? Bullshit. And I'll tell you how it's done. Leibniz Collection, University of Michigan. Phoebe Courtney generated well over 15 texts and in fact is still producing books at this time. Originally we took the bibliography, uh, bibliography from one text, none dare call it conspiracy. 64 specific books were looked up on our MTS system and upon checking we found that better than three quarters of the text were in a specific collection. You cannot look at them, you cannot read them, 
You cannot photocopy them, and you will not draw them from the library. Now, this was back in 1989. We originally did this survey. Of the three quarters of those books, in other words, approximately 42 that were originally checked that were in this collection that you now could not look at, today in 1993, all but two have ceased to exist. Yes, they do burn books, but they especially burn books that have knowledge in them. Frivolous text or side-bending text, in other words, diverting text, they will keep. But those which have to do with the substance of the issues we're talking about progressively are extracted and disposed of over a period of time. Now, the Institute for Social Research had only one, one, co one college library at the U of M campus that it had not enveloped, and that was engineering. By this next year, they will probably have the engineering school. And with that, the last of the texts that were not restricted will be, and then will be taken out. Is this a common practice? Yes. By the way, the Institute for Social Research is heavily attached to the Fabians. Anybody who's familiar with Fabian socialism? The Fabians, originating out of England, enveloped or created a series of programs in conjunction with Rhodes and a series of other individuals to again envelop the American education system, to channel the population, or as they said during the, about the turn of the century, they needed to dumb down American society, both our higher education and our conventional education mechanisms. They did a very good job of it. Were it not for the fact, and this is one thing they did not anticipate, was the self-motivation and self-education on the part of many individuals, we would have lost much of our real history with regard to what was happening and the mechanizations of politicking in this country. Fortunately, too many copies of things are left laying around. Now, would somebody like to burn this? Well, they could now. We wouldn't care. We've made so many copies that they can't find them all. And John can attest to that. In addition to that, though, we're constantly seeking out, and you should too, text, documents, anything and everything that are our original copy. Disperse and separate them. Probably the best example of the dangers of consolidation are what happened throughout the history of the three great libraries that, ex that existed in the past, Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Rome. Over a short period of, of centuries, all three libraries suffered major fires and destruction, which destroyed much of the written knowledge of the population of the globe. You, as protectors and as free sovereigns and citizens, have to ensure that this information is not consolidated and hidden and tucked away in rooms where it disappears. If it is true, it will stand the test in the light of day and need not be concealed or hidden. It is that simple. Well, their mechanization, how they've done this and what they've done, is here and in many other texts, and we've reviewed this before. Well, where are they going now? Well, we'll come back down to the tactical level and give you a little idea of what's going on in the country. I always like to refer to notes because I want to make sure that I get the words right. I hate to have somebody try and repeat something that I've said or to paraphrase it. In Amet, Louisiana, approximately three weeks ago, 130 sheriff's deputies, the ATF, approximately one battalion of Army Reserve personnel, active Army Reserve, the FBI, mixed al alphabets of other agencies, and four black helicopters possessed by the Customs Service, no markings, no identification to indicate that they are American resource, descended upon Amit, A-M-I-T-E, enveloped 15 to 16 city blocks. Any individual trying to leave was incarcerated for the duration of the activity. Any individual trying to enter to return to his home was immediately arrested. His car was detained or he was detained on foot. All individuals were searched. There was no concern for constitutional rights here. This was an occupation force. They then proceeded house by house, door to door. The total accumulated booty for 15 city blocks. We are not talking about 15 houses or 15 rooms. 15 city blocks, a good portion of a community, netted over 100 firearms, which was their primary interest, the confiscation of arms. And this was house to house, door to door. Five rock vials of cocaine. Five, count them. 36 baggies of marijuana, about the size of my fingers put together here. 
and a total of $350 in cash were accumulated. This activity took well over 10 to 15 hours. All individuals arrested in the first few hours of the activity were detained for the duration of the activity. Amet was one of the first four that took place. The next one was in Baltimore, a six city block area, again in the last three weeks, on the same day, at the same time, was enveloped using National Guard forces from the state of Maryland. These forces then went house to house, door to door, room to room, confiscating all firearms and detaining all individuals, male, female, and children. The next activity took place in Chicago with a similar circumstance in the projects. Again, federally controlled. The fourth took place in Washington State and was of a similar ilk. Again, five to six city blocks, not houses, not rooms, six city blocks with similar result. Again, I ask, was this Russia? Was this communist China? Was this Europe? No, this was the United States of America. It's not down the road 10 years, 20 years. It's here in front of you now. But because of the boiling frog syndrome, everybody sits here and waits and watches it happen. We all understand how that works. If you want to boil a frog, you don't try to throw him into a pot of water. You put him in nice medium temperature water and turn the heat up slowly. He'll sit there until he dies. That's exactly what's happened here. Now, tactically, how are they going to operate inside the United States using MJTF police, FinCEN, or United Nations operations groups? Well, I'm going to pass this little report around, if I could. I want you to take a look at the photographs. This is just one small collection of intelligence data that was put together. We have photographs from virtually all over the country of similar activities taking place. The markers that are on the signs that you're going to see specifically identify routes of navigation. The township, the counties, nor the states have marked, marked any of these, these sites. There is a small write-up in brief that you can read with regard to these particular activities. However, in Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, Alabama, Louisiana, California, Washington State, Maryland, Connecticut, Maine, Rhode Island, and almost all of the eastern seaboard, similar markers now exist, though some are more dramatic than others. What do they include? Well, traditionally, the first markers that were identified, and as we discussed before, were about the size of this card and varied in configuration, but basically identify routes. They are on the oncoming traffic sign to your left, not on the sign that you are facing. The specific mission is to, for simplicity's sake, identify routes that individuals might use during activities here in this, in this country. What individuals? Well, we're going to send around another set of pictures. These are a very limited set, but we have a videotape and we have other portfolios that are coming. This is from Louisiana. In the photographs that you are going to see here, 540 East German and Russian pre-deployment vehicles are located near Biloxi, Mississippi, 10 miles north on M49. They are all new combat pieces of equipment, ranging from chemical warfare trucks to infantry vehicles. There were also some armored personnel carriers which apparently have been moved. They are in close proximity to Fort Polk, which as you will recall last fall was converted to a United Nations training facility and is United Nations Training Command North America. There are now foreign forces here. If I could, I'm going to borrow our courier again. The name of the company that supposedly was coordinating this was Airmar. Airmar is kind of like Air America. You all remember Air America. They were, they were involved with that other uh, alphabet soup group, Central Intelligence Agency. Well, strangely enough, Airmar in these pictures is not located on private land. It's located on the, Na the Soda National Park, which is probably, quote unquote, an international biosphere. In other words, the international bankers now possess it. It is not American resource. It is under United Nations control. In addition, a series of other sites have been identified near these vehicles, which are now possessing a large number of foreign military forces. One group has been identified as El Salvadoran. Another group has been identified as both Belgian with some Polish forces. Again, under United Nations control. I will remind you of Passe Comitatus, which has to do with guidelines regarding military forces inside the United States. Each of our states is a republic, 
Remember, in the Constitution, it states uncategorically, we will guarantee a Republican form of government to each state in the Union. Well, strangely enough, under posse comitatus, not even the U.S. military can, can raise arms against the American people without at first an express exchange and command for a specific purpose anywhere in the country by military force. He has to override it, and he has to put his name to a document. No such overt document exists that we could acknowledge. Ah, but we have the United Nations Treaty, comrade. And I will remind you that what is good for the goose is good for the goosey. If you can go to somebody else's country and tell them what to do in their hometown, eventually somebody's going to turn around and eat your lunch. And despite how strong you might think you are, you are but one of many members constituting only 5% of the overall global population. You are nothing to the United Nations in reality. Ignorance is bliss and fatal in most cases. You are a co-signer and in fact are nothing but chattel property under most of the corporate entities that are these United States, now the United States with a capital U. That's how they look at all of us. Do they have the resource capability to do this? Yes, as we discussed earlier with the dispersion of US military forces across the globe, we do not have the capacity inside the United States were it not for American militia, you know, the armed citizen, to repel any existing military force that might attempt activities here, including our own forces used against the American citizenry. Now again, if they are under United Nations Charter, and if they are under United Nations authority, they are not American forces. That's a mistake that's made from the beginning. We've already broken two milestones. In Somalia, US forces for the first time came under direct United Nations control, didn't they? In Bosnia-Herzegovina, we are seeing now the next shift of the knife. Seventh Armor and several US military forces in Europe are now directly under the command of NATO, but specifically under a German general, not an American general. This is a first and unheard of. And George Patton is probably turning in his grave right now. I guarantee. But the fact of the matter is this. If those forces are now under foreign command, they are no longer American forces. They are now sworn to the empire. United Nations Command. If ordered to do so, they can be used anywhere in the United States at United Nations Forces discretion. Again, the President has been set with Somalia. Somalia being a sovereign nation, despite the political politicization and the propaganda, was still a sovereign nation nonetheless, and they occupied it. And we still do. What's good for the goose is good for the goosey. What will shift or change with this? With Bosnia-Herzegovina, with Somalia and Macedonia, what you're going to see is a shift due to the traditional borders of pre-1914. This will not take long to consolidate. It will ensure that there will be no competition for the EEC, European Economic Community. By eliminating Yugoslavia, which was not a great power, but was a strong industrial nation, they eliminated the possibility of a fresh young country coming into the EEC and competing effectively against them. Through clandestine monies and resources, they slit their throat. It's very straightforward. It also served a multi-tier purposes, creating the precedent set for UN forces to intervene inside these nations. Now, what is the strength of UN forces inside the United States? The guesstimations, including reliable numbers, is approximately 300,000 total. It could be higher. We do not have an accurate count. In the last 48 hours at Biloxi, we've had a vast influx of foreign aircraft and foreign military personnel. At a series of other military bases, and we have some photographs here of those particular sites, a large number of foreign military forces have been entering over the last 48 hours also. Does this mean that we have to panic? No, it means that we pay attention and we have good patriots who are already watching to see what's going to happen there. Has the other side become aggressive? Well, in almost every case where public citizens have gone overtly to the gates and to the fences, they have threatened to shoot them in every incident so far. So we have a confrontational situation that exists right now. Probably by the next time that I speak, if not today, God, God please, we may have photographs that have been brought up from uh, from Louisiana of the specific convoys and transports that are involved. Does the other side feel that they can get away with this? Why not? You let everything else happen in the last year. 
Bottom line, as I said before, they burned Waco. Everybody watched it on television and ate popcorn. Had no problem with it at all. Those were American citizens. It's no big deal to find another objective and attempt to do, to do this again. Remember, if they can get away with it, they will continue to actively participate and proceed on a track that they've created. Now, originally I worked as an intelligence analyst and as a counterintelligence coordinator from 1975 through to 1981. And I work now, as, of course, with militia, different militia formations across the country. And we're inter-cooperating. If I were to sit on the other side right now, I know that many of us would be gnashing our teeth. And the reason I say this is because what we've experienced is a situation where they aren't sure how many of us are out there. They know that the American people are in motion. Oh, many of them are butt-cold asleep, make no mistake about that, and will remain asleep right up until the point where their body's in the front yard. Those are not your concern, nor are they my concern. Our biggest, our biggest and mo most important issue is to consolidate virtually all of the particular groups that are across the country, not to come together to some paramount central meeting, but to come together in mind and understand that we have a common enemy that is threatening the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. That is why we are identifying the threat that we're talking about here. Because it all comes back to this. And the Republic is only as strong as those people are willing to support it. No, we're not taking questions. If need be, we will have to fight for it. When necessary, we will fight for it. Treaties do not override the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and specifically can be found. If need be, we will have to demonstrate that. And again, we'll have to first, as uh, Theodore Roosevelt said, use the ballot box, the soap box, and when need be, the cartridge box. And Theodore Roosevelt, of course, was a person who knew quite a bit about that also. Now, where else can we go to find information on the resources of the enemy? This came right out of Hillsdale College, out of the library, where they expunged it and took it off the, off the shelf. In this, this demonstrates, for instance, the elimination of certain activities and actions inside the federal government in 1988 and 1989. I will remind you again of a process, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Now, in other, types, in other situations where we've discussed how the street gangs would be used, and they are being used, they are not an accident, they are an intent, through a series of budget cuts, and we'll pass this document around also that you might take a look at it. The program slated for elimination in 1988 to create the condition. Anti-drug abuse, state and local assistance, juvenile justice, crime control, regional information sharing, and Mariel Cuban's program. Now, of all that were relevant, the least was, of course, the Mario Cubans program. But if you'll understand what that did by bringing or infusing a criminal element into the United States, you'll understand the mission statement involved here. Again, we'll pass this around so we can take a look at it. By creating the condition, and of course formulating with media assistance a series of actions, we create what is called crisis management. Crisis management is a situation whereby the thesis, antithesis, synthesis program or Hegelian concept of government can be best implemented. Who is the first person to key the word crisis management? Henry Kissinger. Who was one of the first people to implement it? Jimmy Carter. Isn't that rather strange that a person from, of, of Kissinger's background supposedly, remember, supposedly a conservative, would offer a program and yet the first person to implement it is a person that supposedly was a liberal. Again, look at the base or the root organizations involved. The people that were involved in this particular program were trying to create, through a series of actions, a national crisis by 1980 and 1981. We all know where that went. The next one was to stem from guns, drugs, drugs, guns, 1988, 1989. And the most recent attempt now is the crime hysteria. This is rather interesting considering that nationally crime has gone down by 4% progressively for the last three years, and I don't necessarily believe all of their numbers, but even with fudging their numbers, they brought up, they, they boosted it as much as they could. The only reason that they had to continue with this is because they have no choice, they have a limited window of opportunity. 
What windows of opportunities are created by a series of these convolutions brought together to create existing experiences that people can relate to, both at our end, what we call the tactical end, and at the strategic end with politicians, to steer them into a particular activity. And they've been very successful in doing so. If you turn on two hours of CFR span, I mean, whoops, C-SPAN, you need only watch and you will see at least two or three CFR members within that two hour period. In fact, uh, here I think at this meeting we have probably the most concise collection of CFR members that are assigned party members, card holding party members we might call them. Call them. These people are both, are both Democrat, Republican, Independent, many are not American. For instance, the Council on Foreign Relations, 80% of it are foreign nationals, not American citizens. The Trilateral Commission, an offshoot created by the Rockefellers, is again only about 80%, is only about 20% American. The rest are foreign nationals. Much like the Federal Reserve, which is about as federal as Federal Express, and of course we all know that's a federal agency, don't we? The Federal Reserve is 90% run by foreign bankers now. That's not exactly federal, is it? May not necessarily have the best interests of the United States, does it? comrade. Ah, but on the other hand, as Andrew Jackson said, after he routed them out the last time, the most dangerous creature that we have to deal with is the international banker with this particular situation. Not that he has any allegiance to any flag. He doesn't. He is an internationalist. And why do you doubt him? He will tell you himself. The illusion is that you ignore his writings. It is best first to delve deep into the writings of the aggressor and study and understand what his objectives are, what his mission is. For that reason, over a culmination of many years, that's how this came about. Why this wasn't made public and why they have to destroy the copies that are available is very fascinating. Because again, what are they afraid of? Well, what they're afraid of is that eventually people will understand and accumulate enough knowledge and data, especially intelligence background, that they might be able to identify both the threat the resources and the capabilities. Once you do so, you can formulate a response. As I said at the very beginning of this, not a reaction. Crisis management dictate that you create just that, a crisis. Avoid at all cost. Sensibly respond. Organize in advance, which is one of the things that most people are certainly not going to cooperate with. I will remind you of an old adage where man-made and natural catastrophes are concerned, the majority is always wrong. Bottom line. So with that in mind, of course, everybody else who might be discussing rationally, certainly not ranting and raving, but using, again, the aggressor's material, is going to be derided, if at all possible, because the only option they have is to attack the messenger, certainly not attack the material. If you have garbage going in, the only thing you're going to get is garbage out. If you've purged the libraries, that's all you get, garbage in, garbage out. What resources are there on our end? What can we do to cooperate or participate with activities? Well, first of all, I do not recommend, nor would I suggest in any way, shape, or form that you join any large organizations. Just the reverse. The smallest and best unit is at the personal level. Wives, family, relatives, best of friends. You have to be able to look into the eyes of the people that you know and know full well that you can trust them. That's always been the strength of the United States because we are independent sovereigns, not slaves following a small or chosen few. By being able to independently decide and protect one another, you are capable of mutually defending one another. Why again do they need the weapons? Rule number one, when Lexington burned, Concord knew that it had. By the time the Federalist forces in Redcoats showed up in Concord and began to burn and pillage there, 10,000 patriots had moved and were effectively able to engage and destroy and rout those foreign forces that were beginning to pillage the real estate. So it happened then, so it has to happen now. Example, when I talk about pillage, by the way, the confiscation laws. Is there anywhere in here 
that allows for the confiscation of private property? No? Thank you. I didn't think there was. Is there in the Communist Manifesto the right to private ownership of land will be abolished, Article 1, Communist Manifesto. A graduated national income tax to strip from the general population usury wealth, second plank, Communist Manifesto. Nowhere in here does it allow for that, nor does it allow in any way, shape, or form for a direct tax of that type. That's what your enemy's afraid of, is because once you realize exactly what he's doing, the fact that most of it is an illusion, then you are going to get angry. And the American people are a very terrible force to be reckoned with when they are angry. The Japanese found out the hard way. Gentlemen, I fear that all we have done is awakened a sleeping giant and fit him with a terrible resolve. The heads are all turning in one direction now. Riot amongst black and white cannot be allowed to take place. I've talked to many black groups. I've talked to many Indian groups. And for the same reason, I will talk to all corners of the nation whenever possible and explain to you this. Step back 10 paces, look up on a 15 degree angle to see who's pulling the puppet strings. They want riot. They expected confusion. We shall give them response. Level-headed, we shall put the fires out on each of our porches and then we shall deal with the threat accordingly. That is the first, best, and only defense. And this more so than anything else. So again, where can we find data or how can we come together without necessarily joining a lot of clubs? Well, a lot of people have generated a lot of data on their own. And the photocopy machine, I'm sure, will be banned as soon as the new regime has total power. And I think you all know why. One page, very concise. It's free. Take it. It's yours. Well, that can't be happening. Well, good. Then go and research it yourself. Why waste my time? If you doubt me, good. Go and look. And when the librarian asks you, well, sir, why do you want to look at that book? Well, there's nothing in that book that you'd want to read. Then you've got to ask yourself, why it is I need an editor to tell me what to read? You see what I mean? Now, other Patriot Reports, as in this one, Patriot Report, Present Truth, P.O. Box 122, Ponderay, Idaho, that's P-O-N-D-E-R-A-Y, Idaho, 83852, is one of a dozen different organizational publications. I would have it sent to a single location and everybody share it. There's about 100 other lesser organizations, 1,000, 2,000, 2 million. From day to day, we are finding that, again, as I said, the American people are organizing on their own. They don't need a central mechanism, a central organization, and we do not want it. Most everybody here, because they're institutionalized, is based upon the pyramidal system. Well, everybody also knows that if you want to destroy a mechanism, you don't need to decapitate it, or as you see the capstone, take it off, the mechanism dies. The American system was not originally set up that way. That was the strength, the foundation that we have as a people. By being spread out and organized well across the nation in many ways, and in every group and with every, every, every element of our people from young to old, from poor to rich, whatever, you'll find that many walks of life are involved with what we're doing, all walks of life, it's a lot of fun. In fact, we have a great deal of fun with this. We have to laugh sometime, it's a serious situation. You will find that it is not that difficult to relate to the people that you need to find when you, when you find them. That it's not gonna be that difficult, you're gonna actually find a bit of relief, you're gonna find a weight come off your heart, I've seen that. Because most people who have been out there have said, well, I'm alone, I, I could see this, but I didn't think anybody else thought this way. Once you allude to somebody else openly and freely as a sovereign, you will find very quickly that other people will step forward with you. Again, that's the strength of this nation. That's why we've succeeded so well. You can't hide in the shadows. You can't skulk in the darkness. What scares the enemy the most is the fact that we can stand here in the light right now and do what we're doing. 
That's the difference between free men and slaves. The only person that I fear is my creator. I do not bend my knee for anybody. I will not bow to anybody. I am an independent sovereign capable of making my own decisions and I will do so. What are questions? Now, and boy, it gets exciting from here. What all is happening in different parts of the country? Well, we know that Fort, that Fort Benning has military activity taking place on a regular basis, but we're seeing a large influx of foreign military forces. Fort Bragg, foreign military forces. We also know that Fort Dix was transferred by George Bush over to UN authority and is now a UN military facility, at least in partial. That one of the two prisons that are established there are an international prison, not a national prison. One of the sites is run federally and is one of the regional prisons. In addition to that, we see that across the Dakotas, North and South, Montana, Idaho, and Washington State, a large proliferation of, of foreign training forces who have also filed paperwork, that's how we track them down, filed paperwork with the state to utilize the facilities so that they could encamp their troops. Strangely enough, they're still going through the motions even though they don't really concern themselves with them all that much. In the south and southwest, from California to Texas, we are seeing a number of foreign forces po positively identified at Fort Ord. The most recent report states that up to 75,000 foreign military forces were brought in over the last month and a half. Fort Ord has been a training facility, but I will remind you that as with Fort Dix, which was planned for closure, Fort Ord is also proposed for closure, and in fact would then, or could then very easily be transferred over to international operations. In addition to that, of course, we know Fort Polk, in which we have some very interesting pictures of both women, children, and male adults in civilian clothes wearing the Miles laser gear so that they can practice using rifle marksmanship amongst the civilian population to confiscate, sort, and separate. This was in also local news publications. One of the things that should be remembered, as we said very early on here, is regional government. Why do I use that term? That's their term. With regional government, they've divided the rest of the mechanism up, though. All of the country up, including the media. That's why they've divided the information so that it is not picked up by the AP. And if it is picked up by the AP, we still have discretional editors who make sure that your newspapers don't see it. One comment made by many of our friends going overseas is that newspapers have generally become pavlum anyway. If you've seen one in Germany, you've seen one in the United States, and the most important thing on this planet that you should be worried about is the fact that a man's private parts were cut off. Yeah. Oh, that's not the most important issue. The most important issue is a tire iron, or I'm sorry, a steel rod to the side of a ice skater's leg. Oh, well, that's not really national news either. But what does it do? It's kind of like bread and circuses, or a diversionary action. In other words, watch this hand, watch this hand, whoops. Now I'll be quite honest. A man's private parts being cut off is not national news for two weeks on the front page with headlines this big. But it is one of the traditional key tools that's used for diversion called sex. And they've become so crude and so rudimentary and they feel that the American population is so dumbed down that it is very simple and straightforward to manipulate people with regard to that. And I will remind you, what was the most important issue when Desert Storm started up and people were laughing when I was at work? I said, well, we're ready for a big war here, aren't we? Oh, <laughs> what do you mean by that? The most important issue when Saddam Hussein was invading, Iraq, was invading Kuwait was what? Zsa Zsa Gabor slaps a cop. And it was on the front page for three days at the top of the Detroit News and Detroit Free Press. Now I will warn you about something when I was intelligence. First of all, we call the media prostitutes. Forgive me, ladies, but that's the only term that we use. We use them for photo intelligence, and even then they've learned to try and, try and crop data and change it. But we learn to use their photographs, and we learn to pick through most of the garbage that they generated. They've gotten worse. They're more severally centralized and controlled. But we call them the prostitutes because they work for money, certainly not for, for any patriotic purpose. Everybody has a paycheck. But in this case, they change as needed whatever story it is that they're generating. When needed, they have been used appropriately to divert and allow for someone to consolidate his resources in Iraq, to divert while somebody consolidates their forces in Somalia, or in Central, a Central Asia, or in Central Africa, or wherever. 
diversion. And again, the more frivolous the headline, the more concerned that I would be about what's actually happening, or as I said before, what are they doing to us now? And if honestly you're worried about what will this do to the world of figure skating, then obviously you need to go back to the education pool and we need to start working on you. Figure skating is important to the people who are in figure skating and is certainly not a, shall we say, a national pastime at best. So with all of this understood, then where will we go? Well, over the next few weeks, and probably in the next week, you're going to see a series of announcements both from MJTF Actions in Maryland and Connecticut. These will include an expansion of the hostile search and seizure activities. How do we know this? Well, everybody seems to forget five weeks ago when Mr. Ben uh, Mr. Benson came on live television and explained to you all how he was going to use house-to-house -house search and seizure. On C-SPAN and CNN, and also some local programs, you will have observed that Janet Reno was identifying the fact through one particular press conference, which is taped, of course, we tape all these fun things, that the house-to-house -house search and seizure program that had been employed locally was going to be taken across the nation. Now, I don't know about you, but number one, I see a blue beret or I see another black uniform, and I see especially with no markings, that's the worst case scenario. Anything near my yard, in my yard, around me, around me, that's war. I understand what the ramifications of it is. I fully understand the ramifications of what I will have to do, and I have no qualms about it whatsoever. We have drawn the line, and it is finished. And if I'm the only one that goes, so be it. But we will. So Janet Reno has already said publicly, Mr. Benson has already said publicly, but what fascinated me about the last news conference, the very last one, they were nervous this time. Lloyd Benson has always exuded a tremendous amount of confidence if you've ever watched him in the media. Have you ever noticed that? He wasn't confident this last time. Mr. Benson may have finally realized that with regard to sharks, they eat their young. Okay, like piranhas too. Mr. Benson and Mrs. Mrs. Reno are expendable. For the first time in American history, we have an associate attorney general. Why? First of all, ask yourself who the associate attorney general is. Well, guess what? That's the man that Hillary and Bill worked for before they got into the Oval Office. Now that's strange. Why create a political position like that? Normally we worry about these shenanigans and they're screamed about in the media. The Associate Attorney General has virtually fallen off the face of the planet and receives no coverage whatsoever. So I have to ask myself again, what's going on here, okay? Janet Reno could probably be perceived, especially after the Waco situation, as the Ernst Rome of this, of this administration. If need be, as an expendable shark, she will be used to her fullest, and with an associate attorney general sitting in the wings, she can be used as an effective scapegoat, pushed off to the side, and the associate will then step forward. Now this is not unlike a situation that took place from 1933 to 1938 in Germany, or from 1921 through 1929 to 31 in Russia. Molotov consolidated his power effectively by eliminating both cohorts and by brushing aside all subalterns below him. Both the number two and the number three man in the Justice Department resigned in the last two weeks and there have been no replacements. What you have is a consolidation of power. It will take but a short period of time for whoever it is that's going to come to the top of the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we call the septic tank, whoops, the pyramid, for that person to kick aside whoever it is that's in the way. Janet Reno is the only person that's in the way of the Associate Attorney General at this time. Once this action takes place, there will be no individual in any tier below able, able of interfering with the Attorney General's activities. And certainly the Congress and the, the Congress is generally weakened at this time and not able to respond properly. Well, considering that we have search and seizure laws, considering that we have confiscation laws, which by the way, somebody mentioned the other day, were changed, no. The confiscation laws were not changed over the last three months. The only part that was changed is that when I come to take this man's home, I notify him that I'm gonna take his home by mail. And then I come and take it anyway, and in 10 days it's mine. So nothing has changed. Have the booty laws changed? Oh, the booty laws, anybody remember those? 
Well, if you are part of the conspiratorial faction, oh, I'm sorry, the law enforcement mechanism who wants to confiscate your home, then you get a percentage of the cut for whatever they're able to acquire from it. If you come into a person's home and you want their VCR, you can take it with you. If you want their camcorder, you take it with you. If I want his shoes, I take it with him. It's that simple. Anything that is there that is property is confiscated and acquired. Is this Nazi Germany 1939? Is this Molotov or is this Molotov's Russia of 1920 or 1930? No. This is America in the 1990s.